Describing Statistical Relationships. The learning objectives for this section are 1. Describe differences between groups in terms of their means and standard deviations and in terms of Cohen's D. And 2. Describe correlations between quantitative variables in terms of Pearson's R. As we've seen throughout this book, most interesting research questions in psychology are about statistical relationships between variables. In this section, we revisit the two basic forms of statistical relationship introduced earlier in the book, differences between groups or conditions, and relationships between quantitative variables. And we consider how to describe them in more detail. Differences between groups or conditions. Differences between groups or conditions are usually described in terms of the mean and standard deviation of each group or condition. For example, Thomas Olendick and his colleagues conducted a study in which they evaluated two one-session treatments for simple phobias in children. They randomly assigned children with an intense fear, for example to dogs, to one of three conditions. In the exposure, exposure condition, the children actually confronted the object of their fear under the guidance of a trained therapist. In the education condition, they learned about phobias and some strategies for coping with them. In the waitlist control condition, they were waiting to receive a treatment after the study was over. The severity of each child's phobia was then rated on a 1 to 10 or sorry, 1 to 8 scale by a clinician who did not know which treatment the child had received. This was one of several dependent variables. The mean fear rating in the education condition was 4.83 with a standard deviation of 1.52, while the mean fear rating in the exposure condition was 3.47 with a standard deviation of 1.77. The mean fear rating in the control condition was 5.56 with a standard deviation of 1.21. In other words, both treatments worked, but the exposure treatment worked better than the education treatment. As we've seen, Differences between group or condition means can be presented in a bar graph like that in figure 12.5, where the heights of the bars represent the group or condition means. We'll look more closely at creating American Psychological Association, or APA style bar graphs, shortly. It is also important to be able to describe the strength of a statistical relationship, which is often referred to as the effect size. The most widely used measure of effect size for differences between group or condition means is called Cohen's D, which is the difference between the two means divided by the standard deviation. In this formula, it doesn't really matter which is M1 and which is M2 when we find the difference between the two means. If there's a treatment group and a control group, the treatment group mean is usually M1 and the control group mean is usually M2. So we would put treatment minus control on the top. Otherwise, the larger mean is usually M1 and the smaller mean is M2, so that Cohen's D turns out to be positive. Indeed, Cohen's D value should always be positive, so it really is the absolute difference between the means that is considered in the numerator. The standard deviation in this formula is usually a kind of average of the two group standard deviations, called the pooled within group standard deviation. To compute the pooled within group standard deviation, add the sum of the squared differences for group one to the sum of squared differences for group two. Divide this by the sum of the two sample sizes and then take the square root of that. Informally, however, the standard deviation of either group can be used instead. Conceptually, Cohen's D is the difference between the two means expressed in standard deviation units. Notice its similarity to a z-score, which expresses the difference between an individual score and a mean in terms of standard deviation units. A Cohen's D of 0.5 means that the two group means differ by half of a standard deviation, 0.5 standard deviations. A Cohen's D of 1.2 means that they differ by 1.2 standard deviations. But how should we interpret these values in terms of the strength of the relationship or the size of the difference between the means? Table 12.4 presents some guidelines for interpreting Cohen's D values in psychological research. 
values near 0.2 are considered small, values near 0.5, or sorry, values near 0.5 are considered medium, and values near 0.8 are considered large. Thus, a Cohen's D value of 0.5 represents a medium sized difference between two means, and a Cohen's D value of 1.2 represents a very large difference in the context of psychological research. In the research by Olandick and his colleagues, there was a large difference. The D was equal to 0.82 between the exposure and the education conditions when treating simple phobias. Cohen's D is useful because it has the same meaning regardless of the variable being compared or the scale it was measured on. A Cohen's D of 0.2 means that the two group means differed by 0.2 standard deviations, whether we're talking about scores on the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, reaction times um, in milliseconds, number of siblings, diastolic blood pressure measured in millimeters of mercury. It could be any of those, but we're still talking about in terms of standard deviations. Not only does this make it easier for researchers to communicate with each other about their results, it also makes it possible to combine and compare results across different studies that use different measures. Be aware that the term effect size can be misleading because it suggests a causal relationship, that the difference between the two means is an effect of being in one group or condition as opposed to the other. Imagine, for example, a study showing that a group of exercises is happier on average than a group of non-exercisers with an effect size of D equals 0.35. If the study was an experiment with participants randomly assigned to exercise and no exercise conditions, then one could conclude that exercising caused a small to medium sized increase in happiness. If the study was cross-sectional, however, then one could conclude only that exercises were happier than non-exercises, sorry, non-exercisers by a small to medium sized amount. In other words, simply calling the difference an effect size doesn't make the relationship a causal one. Sex differences expressed as Cohen's D. Researcher Janet Shibley Hyde has looked at the results of numerous studies on psychological sex differences and expressed the results in terms of Cohen's D. Following are a few of the values she's found, averaging across several studies in each case. Note that because she always treats the men as, or the mean for men as M1 and the mean for women as M2, positive values indicate that men score higher and negative values indicate that women score higher. So mathematical problem solving, there's a small effect size in favor of men. Reading comprehension, there's a small effect size in favor of women. Smiling, there's a, sorry, reading comprehension was a small effect size. Smiling has a small to moderate um, effect size in favor of women. Aggression is a moderate effect size in favor of men. Attitudes towards casual se sex is a large effect size in favor of men. And leadership effectiveness is relatively nothing. Hyde points out that although men and women differ by a large amount on some variables, like attitudes towards casual sex, they differ only by a small amount on the vast majority. In many cases, Cohen's D is less than 0.1, which she terms a trivial difference. The difference in talkativeness discussed in chapter one, the talkativeness between men and women, was also trivial, with a D of 0.06. Although researchers and non-researchers alike often emphasize sex differences, Hyde has argued that it makes it at least as much sense to think of men and women as fundamentally similar. She refers to this as the gender similarities hypothesis. Correlations between quantitative variables. As we've seen throughout the book, many interesting statistical relationships take the form of correlations between quantitative variables. For example, researchers Kurt Carlson and Jacqueline Kennard conducted a study on the relationship between the alphabetical position of the first letter of people's last name, so A equals 1 and Z equals 26, and how quickly those people responded to consumer appeals. In one study, they sent emails to a large group of MBA students offering free basketball tickets from a limited supply. The result was that the further toward the end of the alphabet students' last names were, 
the faster they tended to respond. These results are summarized in figure 12.6. Such relationships are often presented using line graphs or scatter plots, which show how the level of one variable differs across the range of the other. In the line graph in figure 12.6, for example, each point represents the mean response time for participants with last names in the first, second, third, and fourth quartiles, or quarters, of the name distribution. It clearly shows how response time tends to decline as people's last names get closer to the end of the alphabet. The scatter plot in figure 12.7 shows the relationship between 25 research method student scores on the Rosenberg self-esteem scale given on two occasions a week apart. Here the points represent individuals, and we can see that the higher students scored on the first occasion, the higher they tended to score on the second occasion. In general, line graphs are used when the variable on the x-axis has, or is organized into, a small number of distinct values, such as the four quartiles of the name distribution. Scatter plots are used when the variable on the x-axis has a large number of values, such as the different possible self-esteem scores. The data presented in Figure 12.7 provide a good example of a positive relationship in which higher scores on one variable tend to be associated with higher scores on the other, so that the points go from the lower left to the upper right of the graph. The data presented in Figure 12.6 provide a good example of a negative relationship in which the higher scores on one variable tend to be associated with lower scores on the other, so that the points go from the upper left to the lower right. Both of these examples are also linear relationships in which the points are reasonably well fit by a single straight line. Nonlinear relationships are those in which the points are better fit by a curved line. Figure 12.8, for example, shows a hypothetical relationship between the amount of sleep people get per night and their level of depression. In this example, the line that best fits the points is a curve a kind of upside down U, because people who get about eight hours of sleep tend to be the least depressed, while those who get too little and those who get too much sleep tend to be more depressed. Nonlinear relationships are not uncommon in psychology, but a detailed discussion of them is beyond the scope of this book. As we saw earlier in the book, the strength of a correlation between quantitative variables is typically measured using a statistic called Pearson's R. As figure 12.9 shows, its possible values range from negative 1 through 0 to positive 1. A value of 0 means that there's no relationship between the two variables. In addition to his guidelines for interpreting Cohen's D, Cohen offered guidelines for interpreting Pearson's R in psychological research. Values near plus or minus 0.1 are considered small values near plus or minus 0.3 are considered medium, and values near plus or minus 0.5 are considered large. Notice that the sign of Pearson's R is unrelated to its strength. Pearson's R values of positive 0.3 and negative 0.3, for example, are equally strong. It's just that one represents a moderate positive relationship and the other a moderate negative relationship. Like Cohen's D, Pearson's R is also referred to as a measure of effect size, even though the relationship may not be a causal one. The computations for Pearson's R are more complicated than those for Cohen's D. Although you may never have to do them by hand, it's still instructive to see how. Computationally, Pearson's R is the mean cross product of Z scores. To compute it, one starts out by transforming all the scores to z-scores. For the x variable, subtract the mean of x from each score and divide each difference by the standard deviation of x. For the y variable, subtract the mean of y from each score and divide each difference by the standard deviation of y. Then, for each individual, multiply the two z-scores together to form a cross product. Finally, take the mean of the cross products. The formula looks like the one presented in the lower left of the screen. Table 12.5 illustrates these computations for a small set of data, 
The first column lists the scores for the x variable, which has a mean of 4 and a standard deviation of 1.9. The second column is the z-score for each of these raw scores. The third, sorry, the third and fourth columns list the raw scores for the y variable, which has a mean of 40 and standard deviation of 11.78, and the corresponding z-scores. The fifth column lists the cross products, so multiplying those together. For example, the first one is 0 multiplied by negative 0.85, which is equal to 0. The second is 1.58 multiplied by 1.19, which is equal to 1.88. The mean of these cross products, shown at the bottom of that column, is Pearson's r, which in this case is positive 0.53. There are other formulas for computing Pearson's R by hand that may be quicker. This approach, however, is much clearer in terms of communicating conceptually what Pearson's R is. As we saw earlier, there are two common situations in which the value of Pearson's R can be misleading. One is when the relationship under study is nonlinear. Even though figure 12.8 shows a fairly strong relationship between depression and sleep, Pearson's R would be close to zero. Would be close to zero because the points in the scatter plot are not well fit by a single straight line. This means that it's important to make a scatter plot and confirm that a relationship is approximately linear before using Pearson's R. The other case is when one or both of the variables has a limited range in the sample relative to the population. This problem is referred to as restriction of range. Assume, for example, that there's a strong negative correlation between people's age and their enjoyment of hip-hop music, as shown by the scatterplot in figure 12.10. Pearson's R here is negative 0.77. However, if we were to collect data only from 18 to 24-year-olds, represented by the shaded area of figure 12.10, then the relationship would seem to be quite weak. In fact, Pearson's R for this restricted range of ages is zero. It's a good idea, therefore, to design studies to avoid restriction of range. For example, if age is one of your primary variables, then you can plan to collect data from people of a wide range of ages. Because restriction of range is not always anticipated or easily avoidable, however, it is good practice to examine your data for possible restriction of range and to interpret Pearson's R in light of it. There are also statistical methods to correct Pearson's R for restriction of range, but they're beyond the scope of this book.